I think Caterpillar's offered to me a bit of wonder, a bit of intrigue, and also a bit of challenge because you've got to work quite hard. So this is not for the faint-hearted. There are plenty of caterpillars we can see very easily, but in order to get to find a particular species, you have to you have to unravel that life history. You have to read the books. You have to get into get into the what dare I say the mind of that moth. What is it trying to do? Where is it trying to hide? What are the caterpillars going to be doing? What time of the year is it? An early or a late year? And those sorts of things just add value to your understanding of the natural history around you. And I think it makes the whole thing very fascinating. So, um, let me just change the slide. So, there's there's my latest contribution with um, Barry Henwood, uh, field guide to the caterpillars of Great Britain and Ireland. Um, and as you can well see, and for those of you who've got the book, you'll know that that's been beautifully illustrated by Richard Lewington. So this is the latest work, and it is a sort of culmination, particularly for Barry Henwood, who's the lead author of basically 50 years of work on the larvae of macromoths and butterflies. Barry is an extraordinary man who has reared well, probably four fifths of the UK's butterflies and macromoths from eggs. So he's got a deep, deep understanding and, and far more understanding than I have. And I, Kind of think I'm okay. Um, uh, but it's been wonderful to work with Barry um, because he is so, so bright and clever at understanding them and, and being able to pick out those key characters that we all need to separate the species. So there's the team and uh, the field guide was published in early March 2020 and that was just before lockdown. This is kind of you know, a year ago. Um, and yes, we weren't socially distanced because we didn't have to be. We all knew we were probably going to have to be fairly soon, but we kind of got away with it. That was the 9th of March. And so we were literally just days before we all had to uh, go our own ways. And um, it was brilliant. Uh, and, and you can see, see the thing, Barry in the middle. And for those of you who don't know, Richard Livington on the right hand side. And um, a friendly team, actually. It's, uh, you know, it's been great to work. I mean, sometimes I think people find publishing books hard work. I mean, that is hard, but it's sometimes those relationships, you know, you come up with a grand idea, but actually being able to 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 knuckle down and work hard with another person who's got different ideas and different directions and objectives and constraints can be hard. But um, I have to say it's been an absolute pleasure to be working with Barry and Richard and it's been, you know, an easy run uh, for about five years that we've been working on this. Um, uh, Barry was the, the lead author. My job was to raise the money um, and then to do quite a lot of the, uh, the sort of donkey work of getting it into the right style. So we had a style sheet to, for each one of the species that's written up within. And, and you can see that if you've got the book and I'll explain a bit uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, so why did we need this field guide? Well, um, the most recent one prior to this latest field guide was, was Jim Porter's Caterpillars of the British Isles. And that was first published in 1997 and it was reprinted in 2010. And in its day was transformatory, totally amazing. But if you think about it in its day, there was no internet then. Everything was done with a 35 mil um, transparency and camera and with all its you know, benefits and faults that's what was produced a stunning work with pretty much every British species of moth illustrated with a photograph of the caterpillar or as many of the caterpillars as or variations that uh, Jim had available to him so an amazing work in its day but I think those of us who've kind of had that book for you know, 20 odd years, I think have struggled to be able to identify things with certainty from looking at the photographs. The text is okay, probably not enough of it. And so in coming forward with a proposal to Bloomsbury to write a field guide, we wanted to fix that. So we wanted to be able to describe with certainty those species that could be identified with certainty and to be able to illustrate the 
um, the species as accurately as possible so that viewers, that recorders, can actually use the field guide and have more certainty that they are, that they can identify things properly. And it's, it's not to say that, um, that photographs aren't important. And I think for those of us who are into birds, you know, we will have all sorts of field guides on birds and some are illustrations and some are photos and some are line drawings and all the rest of it, plus the internet these days. Amazing to have the internet. Um, we want more, not less material. And so photographs are a very important part of identifying caterpillars as they are every other bit of wildlife because they, they add context and color and, and background that illustrations don't. But nonetheless, if you're simply relying on photos, my view is that that isn't quite good enough. So however much that Barry and I have written and however detailed and carefully thought out that text is, the first thing that anybody does when they come to a Richard Lewington illustrated field guide is to turn to the illustrations. And is it any wonder why? Look at that lot. They are absolutely stunning. So the remarkable detail that Richard is able to get into these you know, modestly sized, and I mean, they're, they're all at, uh, most of these are at about 1.25 times their life size. So just a little bit bigger than life. But he's got into that, that amazing level of detail and also the ability to make the images stand out from the page so that they genuinely look in three dimensions. And that's something I've worked with Richard on during the writing of the Micromoth field guide as well as this one, because actually I did feel some of the macro moths, the Waring and Townsend field guide, some of those just a bit too two dimensional for me. And, and particularly for larvae and particularly for micros, those little sort of kinks and bumps and all the rest are very important. So Richard and I have been working on counter shading for a number of years to be able to uh, lift those illustrations out of the page. And the work that he's done is absolutely stunning here. So look at these illustrations and you can see they're all aligned. And one of the difficulties um, that there is in using photographs is it's very difficult to get caterpillars to line up exactly as you want them to photograph them, to make the images repeatable and comparable. Um, and that is so easy with illustration because you can get them proportionately sized, you can get the background constant, and you can get the color variation illustrated nicely and put next to each other. It's not saying it's not possible, and you'll know that, um, that uh, Ben Smart is, of course, doing that fantastically with the photographs, Micromoth larvae, um, but it's a lot harder. And, and uh, the illustrations that Richard does, they just are amazing. Now, I think Richard would admit that he does cheat these days, is that uh, for those people who've got their iPads and, uh, and Photoshop, is that it's perfectly possible to take um, a fresh illustration beautifully done with um, pen and ink and, and, uh, and paintbrush, and then within 20 minutes to have converted that to something completely different color. And if you look on the left-hand side, the marbled white spots, those are all, one, that's one illustration and just, just photoshopped to produce the other illustrations. Now, in some respects, that sounds like it's cheating, but actually there are many or number of illustrators these days who will only work using digital media. Um, they don't use any paints anymore. So that's, that's the way things are going, and Richard is, is, is not shy of, of wishing to do that. And there's another sumptuous page, a couple of pages of, of his works. Um, wonderful, wonderful. I mean, how he manages to paint all those hairs individually and get them. I think I probably have a little bit too much shake in my hands these days to do it, but he's, he is remarkable. And his work is done by taking the, uh, taking a number of images and, uh, and, and setting them out around his, um, his painting station or his, his iPad and then working from a number of illustrations to integrate all the variation that he's seeing and then putting it in the, all into one image. Right, the text. This is the bit that Barry and I did, which is, of course, the bit that you're all desperate to read and really keen to find out about. So here's a relatively typical page, perhaps a few more photos than, than in most of it. 
but um, an in, a short introduction to the family of, of, of the moths, just to describe something about the, uh, the larvae and the rest of the life history. The, um, the, the description um, is then given to the species with a, a thumbnail distribution map. Um, if there is a need for a, for a photo to show uh, an, the, the signs or, uh, of the caterpillars, then, then we've done that. And obviously for the clear wing moths, that's something that's um, really important because we tend to find clear wings by finding the galls or the holes or the, or, or the broken stems. Um, and, and then that leads us to look for the larvae. Um, I think um, going back to what I said earlier, really important to be able to include the similar species within that. So if I found this caterpillar, which are the ones that are similar to it and how do I distinguish them? Now, a common problem with that is that, of course, so many caterpillars are green. And in, in one sense, all green caterpillars look similar. But, but you, know, you need to look a little bit harder than just saying, I found this green caterpillar, Phil, what is it? You need to be able to just dis think of the features, and those are all described for you within the introduction, that will help you decide which family that this caterpillar might be in. How many legs has it got? Has it got a flat head or a round head? Um, is it, is, it, has it, is it hairy or not? And has it got lines or, or bumps on it, um, uh, you know, which help you decide which family it's in? So um, we've also included, uh, them because there are plenty of caterpillars, and, and here's a group, the wainscots. Um, for those people who go out at this time of the year with a head torch, um, you will inevitably see wainscot moth caterpillars sitting on grasses at night, and they are frankly all but impossible to tell apart. Not all of them, but most of them, and most of them need to be reared through to adult to tell which they are. Um, however, there are some hints that we can give and have given to show which groups of wainscots that they might be in, and some are immediately identifiable for species. So let's um, have a look at these. Um, left to right, we've got um, double line and striped wainscot and brown line, brine, bright eye, and common wainscot. Now, at first glance, those probably look immediately identifiable from each other. But the only one that really is identifiable is the far left, and that's the double line, which is, as you can see from the shape of the caterpillar, it's rather sort of plump, isn't it? Each segment is rather expanded, a bit ballooned, and that's very characteristic of the last instar double line, and it isn't really terribly characteristic of the other ones. But of the other species that are there, they vary so much within a species that you can find that level of variation that you can see between species within a species. And that means that it's really, really hard to be able to identify them to their species within the field. And so what we've done is to, in these appendices at the back, is to give you some kind of some handy hints to know which species you're likely to have found. Um, uh, southern wainscot, for instance, in, uh, in uh, reed beds um, is, is actually immediately recognisable. It looks just like common wainscot lava, but it's much longer, um, you know, sort of a, a third again as long, rather thin looking. So that's immediately identifiable. But, but if you simply went on the, on the colour characters, then it would be identical. So we've also, um, this took a bit of a while, but we've also included a list of the food plants of the uh, species as far as we know. Um, so this took some assembling and uh, great thanks are due to Phil Dean in Devon, who managed to help us uh, effectively electronically extract out of the written text all of the references to the, species, the plant species and and start creating a list for us. So we're certain as we can that this list is correct, but there are just two or three omissions that we've somehow managed to miss. Um, but overall, this does give you a pretty good idea of more or less today's view as to how many caterpillars, macromoth caterpillars feed on how many species in this country. We've not included information um, that comes from Europe, because in Europe, the further towards the centre of a distribution of the species, normally the wider the host plant range. And that means that you can end up with extraordinarily long species lists for some moths when you're starting to record them in Greece or Turkey 
or, or in Italy or indeed Spain. Um, uh, so this is very much a list that relates to our part of the world. So if you take this um, on the continent and you start going to Southern Europe, it won't fit very well in my view. But there you go, it's a list and it's completely out, well, it will be out of date now because people will already have found caterpillars on species of plant that we haven't listed, but that's fine, that's progress. Right, now I'm, that's, that's the book. Let's, let's talk about some life histories. Um, so here is the caterpillar of the beautiful book tip. And it's a typical kind of caterpillar that is um, well, cryptic against lichen or alga covered um, branches or twigs or, or bark. Um, and there are lots and lots of caterpillars that do this. But again, it's about understanding which characters help you to be able to identify which is which. If you look a, a lot more closely at this one, you'll see that the lower edge of the, of the, of the caterpillar has these um, amazing sort of extensions. And these are sort of fleshy, and they're not hairs, they are sort of fleshy protuberances that are coming out of the, out of the skin of the caterpillar. And what amazes me is that not only have we got the color match, where we've got black flecks and spots and stripes, which are looking very much like the lichen colored um, branches, but, but also these fleshy protuberances are almost identical to the, to the protuberances that you've got on these folios lichens. And it is absolutely incredible just that the lengths to which these caterpillars have evolved to be cryptic against their background. And uh, Beautiful Hooked It just epitomizes to me that amazing way that caterpillars just blend in. It's no wonder that we most of the time can't see these things when we're you know, walking along in a woodland. They are, they are genuinely cryptic. Oh, here's another one, scalloped hazel. Here's a pretty common species of moth. Um, and scalloped hazel, for the most part, looks like this. It's a brown stick caterpillar that looks like a twig. Um, identifying it, there are lots of brown sticky caterpillars that look like twigs, aren't there? But identifying it is actually rather more easy than you might think, because there is at least one pair of vestigial legs. This is tiny, tiny legs. If you think of most geometer caterpillars, they've got their thoracic legs at the, at the head end, and then, then two pairs of legs at the back end. But some species have got these vestigial legs, these, these additional bumps that were once legs, but are no longer functional. And that's an easy way to tell a scalloped hazel that either one or two pairs of vestigial legs. So that's a standard scalloped hazel, but it's not always like that. Because scalloped hazel also exists in this color form which is absolutely staggering. It's normally a brown caterpillar with brown and greeny bits, but just occasionally throws this extraordinarily, extraordinary lichen colored form. So what's going on there? How does it do that? And that was to some extent elicited um, rather neatly by Mike Majerus. Um, and, and he did this in captivity. What he did was to introduce little bits of white paper at the bottom of the container that he was feeding the scalloped hazel um, uh, in captivity in, in plastic boxes. And where he introduced little bits of white paper into the container, a much higher proportion of the caterpillars turned into this lichen form as they changed their last instar into the last instar, the final instar caterpillar, compared with those caterpillars which were um, uh, without bits of paper at the bottom of the container, which tended to remain the brown stick form of the scalloped hazel. So what we're seeing here is the ability of caterpillars during their life span, during their larval stage, to be able to change their color morph more or less to match their background. And I think that is absolutely extraordinary how you know, that, that level of kind of evolutionary ability is that they can switch on and off 
genes to be able to help them match their background while they're busily going along during their life cycle. And I think that's absolutely staggering. And that's probably going to be happening in a number of species. Um, uh, for instance, the um, Brussels lace caterpillar, which always looks like lichen, that exists in a kind of a mid-green form and also a blue-green form. We don't know, but it's very likely that if the caterpillars are tend to be sitting and feeding amongst blue-green lichens, then, then in that last instar, the caterpillar will switch to that blue-green morph. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on out there. There's a lot of intrigue and an awful lot still to be found out about caterpillars. So let's start looking at a little bit more um, of, of the sort of mimicking. Um, here's scalloped hooktip. And when scalloped hooktip is young, the caterpillar is sat openly on the upper side of a birch leaf and it looks like a curled up bird poo. Um, and it does that until about the, the end of the third instar, or possibly sometimes into the fourth, but certainly the end of the third instar. And then the caterpillar changes and it becomes into this form. So if you're going to want to be, if to mimic something or other, that, that you don't want to be eaten by an avian predator, then one of the quite cool things to do is to look like avian poo. And caterpillars have done this in a number of uh, families, um, and there are some quite staggering um, bird poo mimics, uh, bird poo mimics in adult moths, of course, um, um, but, but in caterpillars. And I think that one thing that caterpillars do is you, you understand that the size is important because as the caterpillar grows, they, they can't keep looking like bird poo because the bird poo ends up too big and therefore becomes that disguise becomes um, it can become it, it can be um, it can be worked out by the birds. And at some point or other, and it's as the scalloped hook tip grows into the fourth and fifth instar, that uh, that camouflage, that looking like bird poo no longer works. But in the last instar, the caterpillar is still sitting on the upper side of the leaf. So what's it mimicking now? Why would a caterpillar be sitting openly on the upper side of the leaf? It could be it's distasteful, but it's feeding on birch. and We don't really think that the scalloped hook kit caterpillar is, uh, unpal is, is, uh, is unpalatable. We think it's perfectly edible by a bird. Well, I just wonder, we don't know this because it's very hard to do any experiments, but I just wonder if it's looking like um, the old catkin of a birch. Birch catkins are obviously coming out about now, but by the time they get into the summer, and that's the female catkin that's dry, it shed most of its seeds, that's at the time when you start to find scalloped hook tip caterpillars. And so when you've got this dry catkin, I just wonder whether actually the, uh, the uh, larger larva of the scalloped hook tip looks like that. And that's the great thing about caterpillars is you go out there and just, just look at them, just keep your eyes on them, watch what they do, look at their behaviour, and you'll find out all sorts of interesting things about them. Here's another bird poo mimic. Here's the older moth caterpillar when it's very young. Um, and this one looks like just like a fresh bird poo, doesn't it? You know, it's, it's, it's got the shine on the, on the skin to make it look like wet poo. Just extraordinary. And this, obviously because the older moth is quite a big moth, as the caterpillar grows up, it changes dramatically into its last instar. And that's the last instar, older moth. So here it's changed from something that was um, uh, mimicking bird poo to something that's, that's effectively mimicking a wasp or a distasteful something or other. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's probable this is Batesian mimicry, as in this is mimicry where the, the, the caterpillar is, is, is actually palatable, but is mimicking something that's distasteful or poisonous. Um, um, but here, this is, a, this is an extraordinary beast to, to, to be able to find. Now, interestingly, for those people who have found older moth caterpillars in their last instar, they tend to sit on the underside of the leaf. Now, that is a bit strange because you would expect them to sit on the upper side where birds would learn to avoid seeing the black and yellow caterpillar. But anyway, lots and lots of things we don't really know. Now, let's come on to something that really is quite intriguing. 
And uh, much of this information, um, you know, we have gleaned from Professor Daniel Jansen out in, uh, uh, well, he works in the Smithsonian Institute and works a lot in Costa Rica. I'm very grateful for him to allow me to use this slide on the left. This is a Central American hawk moth caterpillar, Hemeroplanes tryptolemus. And uh, on the right-hand side at the top is the caterpillar stretched out. It's got various color forms. And, and the, the hawk moth adult is, is down on the far right there. Now, it's, it's, I think it would, it's undeniably like a snake. And indeed, if you uh, Google, you can do this while you're listening to me, if you like, Google YouTube, stick Hemeroplanes tryptolemus into Google and find a YouTube video of this larva and watch it move. Because not only does it look like a snake, it moves like a snake. And so uh, it's very hard to avoid coming to the conclusion here that there are caterpillars around that look and act like snakes. But I think most of us are going, well, this is a bit odd because caterpillars are usually much smaller than snakes. So what's got, what, what is happening here? Well, we'll come to that in a minute, but that is, that's probably the, the top dog really in terms of snake mimicry. But it's not hard, it's not a big jump to think of our elephant hawk moth as doing something very similar. So, and you can think of those parallels in, in the evolution of the eye in animals, that's very similar. So any character that con confers a slightly, a slightly better advantage it confers a sort of selective advantage for its holders that gets preferentially selected over the generations and and that mimicry be becomes honed more and more towards um, towards looking like a snake but but actually when you look at snake mimicry and, and professor jansen has done that and there are hundreds and hundreds of species in the tropics that appear to mimic snakes and they're at all different levels of all different markings. Some of them look amazing, like the tryptolemus, and some of them don't look very much at all, but they behave in very similar ways and seem to elicit very similar responses um, from birds to them. So our elephant hawk moth, is it or isn't it a snake mimic? And I've included uh, on the right hand side um, the slightly younger larvae, which also have eye spots on them. And you can see the characteristics there of something like eye spots and an expanded um, section behind the head, the sort of kind of proto characteristics, if you like, of a, of a snake. And this here, um, the behavioral response of other animals to caterpillars is actually quite interesting. And this is um, this is Phil Barden's dog getting very agitated by um, um, an elephant hawk moth larva um, in Phil's garden in Devon. Uh, and that was just taken last year. Um, there's something almost kind of innate about the response of animals to snakes and indeed to, to uh, snake-like animals. And this dog was going pretty nutty at seeing this caterpillar. There's something going on there that needs an explanation. And let's see if we, oh, and here's just, just, just before we go on, Oleander hawk moth. This never made it into the, uh, into the field guide probably because they're my shots and probably not absolutely in focus, but it's a good story, so listen. Um, this is the Oleander hawk moth, and if you look at the camouflage associated with that, you can see here's a typical green hawk moth caterpillar with a nice uh, white stripe down the side of it, mimicking the, um, the uh, well, looking just like cryptic against the central vein on the leaf of the Oleander and, and the green, beautiful shade of green that just seems to match beautifully that. But if you tap the um, oleander hawk moth caterpillar on the head, something dramatic happens and it produces these electric blue eye spots. And in an instant, you get this uh, whipping round of the front end of the caterpillar underneath and these uh, eye spots emerge that are puffed up. And, um, and again, that's that sort of snake-like eyes that are, that are appearing. So what do we think is going on? Well, Dan Jansen um, um, believes, and I think we're pretty convinced that, that it is, that um, uh, birds are hardwired to recognize snakes. So we think of um, distasteful 
uh, you know, birds learning to avoid distasteful um, uh, caterpillars. So uh, a blackbird pecking at a cinnabar larva, they get a horrible taste in their mouth, they learn that's horrible, so they tend to avoid them. Well, for birds and snakes, um, encounters by, um, by, by birds of, of snakes are, are likely to be lethal, most likely to be lethal, and therefore um, the evolutionary pressure is, is obviously not to test whether that's a snake or not, but to avoid it in the first place. And so we believe that birds are hardwired, it's very difficult to do the experiments, and indeed all of this evidence is circumstantial, it's, it's really hard to do it, but it's kind of fascinating to go along with the thought process, even if you don't want to believe it. But we believe that birds are hardwired to recognize um, um, uh, snakes and, and to respond to them. Now, what about what is it about the snake that they're recognizing? Well, in a complex environment, the snake um, doesn't always appear as a fully fledged snake. It might be there are contrasting colour marks, an expanded head, eye spots, eyes. But when moving through vegetation, distance is important and how much you can see is important. So it's almost certain that birds recognise not a beautiful picture of a snake, but certain visual cues such as eyes or colour change or expanded. And because uh, they look uh, because birds are looking through complex vegetation to find prey. As soon as the combination of eye spot and color and expanded, whatever expanded segments hits hits the nerve, then the bird's response is to flee because it cannot afford for that you know for that encounter to be a real snake because it will likely die, and that means that size does not have to be important or. Um, a mimicking animal needs to do is to be able to produce the visual cues that elicit the anti-snake response. And that's what we believe is going on. And that's why we believe that even in this country, there are snake mimics that are here and about us. And that's the interesting bit that I think when you start looking through the caterpillars of the UK, you go, ah, that starts to explain it. And Look at dark spectacle. Dark spectacle has got two yellow eye spots and an expanded segment and a narrowing head at the front end. It doesn't look much like a snake to you or I. In fact, it looks rather like a dark spectacle caterpillar. But actually, to a bird that's just moving through vegetation, if it comes across those cues, then it's very likely to go, I don't want to go any near that. And when you look through caterpillars, you find other examples. And it's not just in the caterpillars either. Lilac beauty pupa. Now, lilac beauty, you can see there, it's got black spots, pale behind the, um, behind the black, and an expanded middle. And that's an extraordinary thing about a pupa. Why would a pupa have an expanded middle like that? I mean, it, it's quite bizarre. Not only that, but the lilac beauty, as you can see, pupates rather like a butterfly or a number of butterflies, it makes a single silk strand around the, uh, the girdle, around the middle of the pupa, and hangs openly on the underside of a leaf, so it's perfectly visible. All of the species around it tend to pupate on the ground or in, 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 in scrunched up leaves and are usually hidden from view. But here's a species that is not hidden from view. And as you well know, lilac beauty is an extraordinary moth as it is. It looks like scrunched up leaves. It's got the most bizarre lava. The whole thing about the life history of lilac beauty is really rather intriguing. We don't know, of course, that that is a snake mimic, but it might be. So that gives you, this is, the, this is a, towards the end of the first half now, that just gives you um, a sort of a, a brief window into what's going on in our natural history of caterpillars in this country. And um, well, if you haven't, bought the book, then I kind of commend it to you. It's, um, I think it, it, it's, it's full of interesting stories. It's got a lot of information in there and it really should help you kind of want to, want to look beyond your moth trap and start to go out into the field and start identifying and finding caterpillars. And um, well, I have to say it's had some pretty good reviews thus far, but um, my, my favorite thus far, I think is from Peter Marin, 
who did describe it as really quite a nice field guide. So I'm very, very pleased to receive that from um, an author who I rate a lot. Um, uh, you know, and it's been, it's been great to produce this book and I hope it will be of great value to all sorts of recorders. Okay, so I think that will be the first half. Let's go and have ourselves a little break. Um, answer that question while you're having a break, if you like. Um, and, uh, and we'll see what you reckon, Justine, in about, is it 10 minutes? Or are we having a five minute break? Is it? Well, five, 10 minutes, you know, uh, yeah, five, 10 minutes. Um, five, ten. So if anybody has any questions. Oh, yes, yes. Um, then fire away. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you want me to unshare my screen? Yeah, and then we can see people if they sort yes, of put their hands up. Yeah. Yeah, yes, nice description. Thank you, Justine. Phenotypic plasticity. Yeah. Yes, that's what a great phrase. <laughs> that, is, that is great, isn't it? Yes, I kind yeah. of admit um, it. But it is extraordinary, isn't it? How. Yeah caterpillars can exhibit that during their life cycle you know but uh, and that's because when they change their skin they have that opportunity to change direction if you like don't they yeah they're, absolutely there's a, a changing from one morph to another morph um so we shouldn't be too surprised but we do it's it is quite an eye-opener i think that, that absolutely i mean if you think how many eyes do a caterpillar have well they've got these little ocelli on on the on the top of their head so their visual cues that they're picking up are matters of light and dark and differences in that. So they haven't really got proper eyes, but they're able to determine quite a lot about their environment by integrating what they're uh, receiving in those in those uh, ocelli on the head. It is astonishing. It is. Hmm. Ooh, um, so, Ben, what are any hints on specific macromoth larvae to look out for? Look out for now. Um, right, well, the, the, this, at this time of the year, I don't know whether it's still possible. Depends what your commonest hawk moths are in, in Lancashire. But um, this is the time of year that most of the um, old entomologists used to go pupa digging. It's not really a thing anymore, is it? But, um, but, but I, my dad used to do it. He used to do it in, in Mitcham Common in London. Um, and used to go digging for eidhawk pupae at this time of the year um, ar around the bases of numbers of trees. Um, and, uh, but at this time of the year, most hawk moths are in the pupal stage. I'm just trying to think of this, if there are any which aren't, and I think they probably all are in pupa now. Um, how far does, how far north does um, uh, a, a broad border bee hawk get? Does that get into Lancashire? No. No? Oh, that's a shame. So you lot are going to have to come south then, aren't you? Yeah, we, we don't have many hawk moths. You don't, you don't have that many? Not, not really. Um, a lovely, the lovely thing, well, do, do come down south when you're allowed to, because <laughs> come, well, sometimes even the end of April, you know, which is why I say it's probably one of the earliest around, but certainly into May, the, um, the rhododendron is out, then, then, then the adult moths are, are around and feeding on rhododendron blossom, and then you can watch them laying their eggs, and that is absolutely fascinating. They like honeysuckle in sunshine, so they're quite the opposite to the white admiral, which lays its eggs obviously in in, in, um, in the deep shade on honeysuckle. And then the the uh, you can watch them lay a single egg, and particularly. In, on those long strands of alcohol that tend to stick out of a bush um, that have grown. And, and it'll be a single white egg on the underside of a leaf. And then when that hatches, um, honeysuckle is quite a poisonous plant. Mm. So the caterpillar, which is why the white admiral tends to lay on the shaded plants, because the, there are fewer uh, noxious chemicals associated with the leaves, we think. But the broadboard of bee hawk then makes little holes in the leaf where it feeds either side of the midrib. And it feeds for a very short time making a hole and then swaps to the other side of the midrib and makes a hole. And then comes back and across the midrib and makes another hole. So you end up 
with four or five tiny holes either side of the midrib. And you think, well, what's going on there then? What I think it is, is that when the caterpillar makes a hole, it's literally minutes before the plant responds to ooze out the juices, which are full of noxious chemicals. And so the caterpillar, in order to start feeding, just is nipping in there and taking a little bit, then popping to the other side and taking a bit, and then coming back again. In the end, you know, when the caterpillars got bigger, they start eating whole leaves because obviously their digestion then is able to cope with the uh, cope with the, the chemicals that are there. But certainly while they're young, um, they they have these extraordinary behaviours, and it's often great to watch young caterpillars um, having a you know trying to work out how do they manage to avoid um, uh, you know, the, the noxious chemicals that plants are desperate to put out there to stop them feeding on it. And I think for those who tell me to shut up, by the way, because I can go on. <laughs> um, but if, if for those of you who are interested in rearing, say, ruddy carpet, royal mantle, um, uh, wood carpet, common carpet, all of the caterpillars that tend to feed on the bed straw family, um, you have to be very, very careful. I don't know whether you've tried it, Ben, but, um, but feed, feeding caterpillars on bed straw, what, if, if you've had eggs, and you start feeding on ladies' bed straw, do not change to hedge bed straw because the caterpillars will die. Um, it's really important to keep those caterpillars going on the same species of bed straw and don't swap onto cleavers either. You know, just make sure that you keep them going. And there's something about it is that the, 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 the caterpillars almost, their gut microbiome probably gets used to dealing with the chemicals that that it's that it had when it was a very young caterpillar and need to have that all the way through otherwise they succumb so um, life being a caterpillar but these are these are wonderful behaviors that, that that they seem to have to be able to uh, get through get through to their uh, adulthood fantastic great so any yes um did that go as far as you wanted ben <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it gave me a lot of things. Yeah, um, I have reared common carpets, but right. from egg, but on on cleavers, and I just kept it on cleavers throughout, and it seemed happy enough with that. No, um, yesterday, maybe the day before, mm. I found some um, some uh, twigs of a uh, goat willow that I'd, I'd cut and put in a jar in the house, and there's some droppings appearing under one of them, and it turned out there was a slender pug larva on it. And it made ah. me think, could be macromoth field, oh, you actually, see. Yes. So. I mean, sorry, sorry. What I misread your comment in the in the uh, macromoth larvae. This is I, I just misread it as hawk moth larvae. Yeah, I, I wondered if you had. <laughs> yeah, I, I certainly had. Um, okay, macromoth larvae. Oh, crumbs, there are plenty. <laughs> right. How long have we got? Um, one of the great things to do at this time of the year is to collect up catkins. And sallows and sallows, willows and poplars because if you do that you will find that a number of them have got young caterpillars in them and those caterpillars tend to be of some things that i think are quite hard to find otherwise so things like yellow line quaker red line quaker brick um, uh, um, and if you're out on the willows on the heathlands you might find um, flounced chestnut for instance which is a hen's teeth down here but i suspect is a Fairly widespread moth still with you. Um, um, so lots of things. And if you're down in the London area, then collect up poplar catkins and you might find, well, you will find pale lemon sallow, uh, which is very well established in southeast England, but doesn't quite go as far as Dorset. Um, so so that, that's a nice thing to do. You will also find, um, yes, and, and Ben's already mentioned slender pug, those will feed in the catkins as well. So collecting catkins is good. Um, beating, how about slow pug? I mean, that's around with you, is it? Slow pug? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go out and beat slow blossom, I mean, it's very, it's very, it's just out here now. And my guess is presumably, are you a week or so behind us or have you got slow blossom out already? Just coming. Just coming. Give it a week, give it a week or 10 days and then go out and beat the slow blossom and hopefully you will find a slow pug larva within that. Um, and if you did the same for the hawthorn blossom, you'd find green pug larva. So 
Um, now, gradually as the blossoms come out, then, then you tend to find um, the larvae associated with them. So maple pug, that's a nice one to find in maple pugs when they're, when they're out in about four weeks time. Um, so, it, so that's for things as they emerge, as the plants emerge, but there's nothing quite like going out on a, on a mild-ish night, uh, even with a hint of drizzle, with a head torch, and just bring up down the lanes um, uh, and collecting up larvae that you find on, on the ground, on the vegetation, either climbing up grasses or on herbs or sitting on walls. Um, you need to be in somewhere, I think, pretty rural to be doing really well with that. Um, uh, but um, larvae are around pretty much any day of the year, or any night of the year. Um, and and you know, March, April, early May, really, really good time for finding larvae. So if you, if you went up into the Lake District or nipped up even further into Scotland, then there are always lots and lots of larvae out at night, um, you know, starting to climb. Like Bilbury, Bilbury, what a wonderful place, Bil Bilbury Moorland. Go and go out with a sweep net or with your torch and have a look at Bilbury Moorland. Always things out there. Um, as, as, as the leaves start to expand, then the, there are larvae out there. So great stuff. It's, um, oh, I just need to be, is it, when am I going to be allowed out? Monday, is it? <laughs> I can stop being local on Monday. Is that what it is? And so I can finally, finally, hopefully get out and do some, do some larva hunting. Um, in fact, one of the species I will probably be doing on Monday night is to go and look for flame seed moth, which is now resident in southern Britain again, having gone extinct for several decades. But it's back now. It's, there is a regular migrant moth here. Um, stunning, stunning autumn moth. Um, but uh, just before we published the field guide, uh, Harry and I went on to Portland to have a, a last ditch attempt to see if we could find the caterpillars. And uh, we found uh, over a dozen of them one evening um, in mid-April, uh, feeding on uh, ribwort plantain. And, um, and they, they were obviously huge, a couple of inches long, these things. So it was pretty obvious we'd found them. And um, so it's, it, the nice thing about finding caterpillars is you know that that's where they are. That's the breeding spot, if you like. That's where the female, or near where the female decided to lay the eggs. And that effectively confirms it as a breeding species in your area. So uh, whereas, of course, moth traps, things wander, things move. And you never quite know whether things are resident. Anyway, there we go. So how are we doing? We probably, I've talked through my 10-minute uh, break. <laughs> any more yeah. chat? Any more on the any chat? Question, Quinn. Oh. We got. Let me just check that. Oh, can I ask as a complete amateur? Will I be able to die some caterpillars just in situ, so to speak? Um. Yes. Yes. Uh. That's exactly right. Um. Some caterpillars, and and this this book will help you. Um. You do not have to bring every caterpillar indoors to rear it and to look at it. It will certainly help to look at it under decent light. So if you do go out at night, my, my guess is it would be better to uh, you know, bring them into natural light, look at them, identify them, and then release them. Because light is really important for identifying caterpillars, as it is adult moths. Um, there will be some you can instantly recognize. Most of the tiger moths are, are, are relatively straightforward. So at this time of the year, a ruby tiger will be out in sunshine, crawling around during the daytime. And ruby tiger, it just looks like a pretty standard tiger moth caterpillar, very hairy, kind of mid-brown. Uh, some of them in your part of the world may be rather blackish. And towards the back end, the hairs are, um, um, are swept back. And so they look, um, they, they, so the hairs, rather than sticking up, tend to be swept back. And that's very characteristic of the tiger. So, so uh, that will be instantly identifiable. And, and you can write that down in the book and move on to the next one. And so this book does help you with that. And uh, you know, unless it tells you that there's something really tricky about this species, then, then the species are identifiable based on the larval, uh, larval description that we give. <laughs> Um, I think just to add to that, if yeah. you want to remove a specimen from the field, um, a couple of decent photographs 
will do one from the side and one from above yeah and capture as many of the features as possible um but it isn't always possible as you've already touched upon throughout the instars they can vary and earlier instars i find are quite difficult to identify a lot of the time and and this and, and the, the field guide to the camera makes that point is that realistically we are only dealing with last star larvae that's at the stage at which the caterpillars have acquired most of their defining features um, there are so many small green or small brown caterpillars that you may as well put them back oh, no. if, you're not going to, if you're not going to rear them through to last in star and then release them just leave them where they are precisely Only try and collect the big ones that, that have got decent markings on them and then you've got a good chance of identifying them Right, shall we move on? Yes, absolutely, right. Okay, now this next section is, is less, a little bit less structured, um, a bit more of a hodgepodge uh, about some, just basically some macromoth life, life histories I thought you might be interested in knowing about. And, and um, let's, let's uh, continue to share the screen. Has that come back okay? Yeah, it's all good. That's all good. Okay, so do drink a moth larvae actually drink dew? And the answer to that is probably not. <laughs> because they sit up on the grass early in the morning and they collect dew on their hairs, but in reality, why would they need to drink? <laughs> they, they, are, they are eating grass and reeds, um, which are 98% you know, water. It's extremely unlikely that they need any more fluid. <laughs> Um, than they're already getting from the vegetation they eat. But nonetheless, drinker moth, nice caterpillar. And very shortly, people will be finding drinker moth caterpillar out and about you know, by, by mid-April, um, relatively straightforward to find on a, on a you know, decent country walk. Right, let's, um, let's look at something. Green islands. Green islands, I know Ben knows this, and I'm sure Steve does too, and maybe everybody else. But really, does everybody know this? what are they and how are they formed what's going on here with green islands because in the autumn when the leaves fall we very often find that some leaves have got green patches on them call them green islands if you like and um, this is a shot here of um, of a, a little ectodemia micromoth which has got the green islands that are all formed in a very particular place and that's kind of telling us something that there's a caterpillar feeding down the base but let's see if we can work out what's going on here so here are some green islands that are formed in oak leaves and i think oak's probably one of the easiest species when and particularly by i don't know early to mid-october when most of the leaves have fallen and most have gone brown and then you end up with these extraordinary green patches and they are vivid green. So what on earth is going on that makes this so, so, so vivid, so happening? And, and you can see why the caterpillars are doing it. It's because they're feeding on the leaf, even when the leaf has fallen to the ground. Well, the, um, I think some Austrian entomologists who discovered what was going on here is that it's a symbiotic relationship between the caterpillar and bacteria. And the bacterium is was in the genus of Volbachia. And Volbachia is probably one of our most successful, the in, it's probably an incredibly successful insect living bacterium. It's in, as far as we know, 60% of all insects that have ever been tested have got Volbachia in them. But what happens really interestingly here, so Volbachia is living within the gut of the caterpillar and, and um, it's, it's very abundant. And what happens here is that there's some sort of relationship. We don't quite understand whether it's a chemical produced by the bacterium or whether the bacterium's presence in the caterpillar causes the caterpillar to produce the caterpillar but what to produce the chemicals but basically what the the combination of caterpillar and bacterium are doing is to produce cytokinins and cytokinins are plant hormones 
And cytokines are very important plant hormones because they control uh, whether the leaf is alive or dead. So during the main growing phases of, 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 a, of a plant and during the, 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 the main season, the spring summer um, season, cytokines are there in order to maintain the healthy production and survival of chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is what makes leaves green and therefore that's what keeps the plants alive. So it's a very, very important hormone for plants. So here's something where whatever's going on, as the leaf falls, cytokinins are being produced to maintain the green in the leaf. Now the plant has very definitely switched off cytokinin production in the early autumn and therefore the leaf dies but in doing so the plant has withdrawn most of the nutrients from the leaf to take back into the root system to survive for the following year. It doesn't just abandon the nutrients to drop onto the ground, not a lot of them. So we've got a situation here where the uh, bacteria moth caterpillar interaction is maintaining the green island as a result of this plant hormone production. That's about as far as I know that's going on there, but it is absolutely extraordinary that there's this complex relationship and you can walk out into any woodland and see this complex relationship going on all the time um, uh, in, the, in the autumn where caterpillars producing green islands on virtually every plant that you look at. And it is quite extraordinary how, how wonderful that this is. And beautiful, isn't it? They want, they're artistic, aren't they? They are amazing to be able to go out. I love autumn time because of all these leaf miners are out there and, uh, and that amazing story that's going on. And then just here's one of the species. So the first sh slide I showed was, was of um, Ectodemia argyra pisa, I think. Um, and I think those actually came from Canada. But uh, in this country, we've got several species that are on poplar leaves. Um, this one is Ectodemia turbidella, and um, that's a very much enlarged photo of the adult down the bottom left. But the leaf mine starts in the um, in the stem. You can see uh, you can see my cursor just waving around here. That's where the egg was placed, and the caterpillar has bored into the into the into the petiole or into the, into the stem leading up to the into the PTL here and, and mined it out and actually caused a bit of a, a growth change, which causes a bit of a twist. And effectively, only when the leaf falls to the ground does the caterpillar then feed within the blade of the leaf. And it makes this very characteristic twin track of frass within the leaf. And then the caterpillar feeds. And um, probably in this case, the caterpillar is withdrawn itself back into the um, into the PTL to to rest during the day and then comes out to feed at night and eventually makes a little half moon cut out and drops out of the of the leaf. So Green Island, very interesting stuff. Now I'm just going to show you just a couple of random things about well why does Ben spend so much time and indeed Steve looking at one spot? What is it about? What are you why? Can't you just go somewhere else? No, it's just because some micros do really interesting things in very, very small areas. So here is a, here's a, a bit of the Purbeck Cliffs. So Swanage is some way off to the left and, um, and uh, Ballard Down is above you with all those amazing butterflies and lots and lots of Adonis Blues. Wonderful stuff, but frankly, in comparison with the micros, dull. Um, so on the cliff, the really dangerous bit, yeah, it's quite tricky to get up here, there are two micromoths that genuinely, in my experience, only exist in these little ovals here. Um, they might be slightly more widespread. I suppose in theory they could be over here, but this is vertical cliff and I'm never going to find it. But I can just about manage to crawl up here and, and find these two species. And they are amazing species. The first is associated with rock rose. And the rock rose that tends to grow on the cliff tends to be very stunted. And when it gets stunted, when you get up onto the cliff, you will see that the leaves are extraordinary, is that much of the green leaves have been turned brown. You think, what on earth is going on here? And 
What this is, is one of the Coleophora cases, and this is Coleophora ochrea. Um, so the, these Coleophora case bearers, Coleos is a case and four is the bear, and ochrea is, relates to the, uh, to the ochreous nature of the adult moth. And the case is this. So here is the case actually feeding on the um, flower bud. Um, but uh, so the caterpillar is living within this case, and um, it's, uh, it, it, makes a, it makes its case out of a series of mined leaves. So it picks off a leaf, cuts it out and sticks it end on. So you end up with this kind of herringbone effect. And it's wonderful. I mean, this, this case is quite big. This is about an inch long. <clears throat> so this is a decent sized case. But what is amazing is the nearest colony of Coleophora ochrea to this one at Studland, I think is probably now in, um, in Bristol. Um, uh, in, at Clifton, near Clifton Suspension Bridge, <clears throat> and now I think there's another one on the Gower. Um, and there might be there might be some heading Kent way, but but it's extraordinary how these micromoths can exist in very very small areas. But the moth, as you can see from the amount of feeding it, is abundant. So these tiny micromoths, you can overlook them so easily. I mean, who would ever have thought that the rock rose? There's plenty of rock rose on Ballard Down, but you never find the case there. You have to walk over the edge of the cliff in order to find the cases. And then when you see them, they're abundant. And they're genuinely in, a, in about a 50 by 50 meter patch. And that's it. The next one that's in a very, oh, and then there's the adult moth. Beautiful, beautiful Coleophora moth. As you know, most Coleophora, not terribly interesting as adults, but this one, lovely. The other species is associated with rock, just piles of heaps of scree that just, I mean, this is old quarry scree on, scree on Portland, but uh, on, on, the Stub, on Studland Cliff, that's, um, that's a natural scree that's formed from the hard, uh, on at Studland, it's the hard chalk, but here in this picture, it's uh, Portland limestone. And what we're looking for is this tiny, tiny case-bearing moth called Eudacea richardsoni, dubbed Richardson's case bearer. Uh, Nelson Richardson lived Oh, a few hundred meters from where I am tonight in Weymouth, and uh, found the, uh, the, the adult moth in June, which looks like that. And it's a tiny uh, tiniered moth, so it's a, it's a tiny clothes moth relative. And these cases sort of looked like the case bearing clothes moth case, but actually they're formed of silk and tiny granules of, of alga and of rock. And the case um, or the caterpillar appears to feed for two years on grazing on algae and possibly lichens on the underside of rocks. And the only places in the world where we know this occurs are on Portland, on the west and the east weir, at Studland Cliffs in that little circle that I showed you, and recently there is a population that's been found in Switzerland. And that's it. So some of these micromoths can exist in these extraordinarily restricted areas and seem to be getting on just fine, which is amazing. And we hope that that will obviously continue forever and a day, but who knows with a warming climate what the effects might be. So there's something. <coughs> now for my final piece, I'm just going to talk to you about little, little things that are on Heathland. Okay, lowland heathlands, but not necessarily lowland heathlands, also found scattered over the country. And that's this bagworm moth, Acanthopsyche atra. I apologize for the name, but I didn't name it. Now, Acanthopsyche atra is a bagworm. Bagworms are remarkable insects in that they have quite a plastic kind of uh, sexual life history is that a number of species have abandoned males altogether and are just parthenogenetic, so they just lay fertile eggs and continue their generations. Um, and a number have wingless females, so it seems very difficult that the female can fly anywhere to disperse. And this Acanthopsyche atra is one of those. So in the top of this picture, we've got the tiny case uh, of, of uh, first instar caterpillar of Acanthopsyche atra that's just hatched and formed its first case and is going out and feeding on bits of heather. It then spends a couple of years doing that 
and finally pupates, um, having formed quite a big case on the right hand side um, um, with this sort of extension here, which is the male extension. The female doesn't produce a, a silk extension like that. And then here's the female. That is the perfect adult female. No better, no worse than that. So this female has no wings, no legs, no scales, no antennae. It's a blob. What is going on here? And then here's the male. Other than being slightly dull looking, it's kind of an interesting male. It's got a typical egger-like antenna. So, so this is a moth that's going to be responding strongly to pheromones. Wonderful hairy thorax and these slightly scaleless shiny wings. Well, let's see if we can unpack this life history. So here we go. Where are we going to start? Let's start with the eggs. Let's just say we've got some eggs now and they're going to feed as they do for two years. And as they feed, the case grows and adds more fragments of silk to it. And in the end, the larva pupates in the case. But it depends which way up the larva pupates as to what happens next. The male caterpillar always pupates head up, which in my description here is actually head down. So as in the, the front end of the pupa is up here. Oh, that's the wrong way. Previous. Uh, the, the front end is, is here and the back end is up here. The female does one of two things. It either pupates head down, as in the head of the female larva is there, or head up, as in here. And that determines everything about what happens next. The male hatches ordinarily and flies around and tries to find a female. The female hatches within the case, whether it's head up or head down. If the female is head down, as in it's facing the bottom of the case, it is entombed. It cannot move from there because it has no legs, no wings, no antennae. It, it can't do anything. It is absolutely stuck within that case. Frankly, all it can do is stick its genitals out the end and wait for a male to come along and mate, which is exactly what happens. If the female has pupated head up, then it has options. First of all, it mates. And what happens is the, 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 the female emits the pheromone within the case and the male flies to that case and mates within the case. So the male has to extend his abdomen in through past the female right the way down to the bottom end of the case and mate. So the male has to expand its body three times the length that it is at rest with air in order to be able to mate. So that's an extraordinary thing in itself. Then the, the, the female, once having mated, then can wriggle because this, this female, although it has no legs, no antennae, no scales, and all the rest of it, it does move by peristalsis. It moves just like a maggot. And it can basically squeeze its way out of the case and fall to the ground. And when it falls to the ground, it continues to look like a maggot and wriggle like a maggot. And that is probably how its dispersal is happening, is that it is actually actively attracting a predator to eat it. Because if you feed the female of this Acanthopsyche atra, as was done in Sweden, to robins, and then keep the robins in captivity and collect their poo, two to three weeks later, out of the poo come live caterpillars. How extraordinary is that? So here we have, throughout the life history of the last 200 million years, by and large, moths have been evolving to try and avoid being eaten by birds. And here is a case where actually the tables have turned. And in order to create some form of dispersal, that the, here we have a situation where the birds are being actively attracted to the moth to eat it, to help it in its dispersal. And that is where I will leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Right. No, thank you. Um, 
another superb talk. Um, they have such fascinating uh, life histories, the bagworms, um, and uh, it's one that you know I, I I'm quite interested in. Uh, same with the coleoptera, you know, the cases. Um, the adults are, are quite difficult, but the, the host plant specificity, the you know of of the adults is quite astonishing and makes it quite easy to to get to grips with them. Yeah, ab absolutely right. And um, oh, dare I do it? Oh, come on, that's a plug, isn't it? Um, I, I'm I'm now redoing with Mark Parsons the field guide to the micromoths, and indeed, Ben is going to be helping us. Thank you, Ben. And we are going to be covering a lot more of the Coleophora cases where those can be identified to species based on the shape and size and the food plant that those cases are on, which is going to be absolutely fascinating. That's fantastic. Um, so uh, so watch this space for a few years time. Um, but uh, but yes, I mean, it, life history is just extraordinary, aren't they? Yes, I mean, we're all committed to our moth traps. We love going and dipping into them and finding out what we've caught that morning and the rest of it. But actually, there is this amazing sort of wonderment out there of, of everything that's going on around us. And, and as I say, you don't need to go very far to find something extraordinary in the, in the natural world, um, in, in life histories, whether it's a, something that's amazingly cryptic, whether it's something that's doing something bizarre. Um, but it's there for the finding. And there's so much we don't know, particularly in the micromods. But even in the macromods, we've written a field guide. That field guide in 10 years will be totally out of date because people will have found out so much more. And, and the great thing about natural history, and particularly in this country, is so many people are interested uh, that it, it's, it's fantastic. It's wonderful. You know, the quicker these books go out of date, the better, in my view, because, because that means people are out there enjoying them. Um, anyway, shall we see, to, before we uh, get Ben to do his bit, are there any questions that I should be answering? Whereabouts in Switzerland? I genuinely don't know. I'll take it away and we'll try and find out for you. Um, uh, that presumably means, Jane, you go up to uh, Switzerland, does it? Oh, well, yes. It'll be on some mountain slope somewhere, but it will probably be in one valley, but not another. <laughs> um, right. Uh, Luffia Furcultella, yes. Thank you. Um, the Female, I mean, interesting, Luffia furcultella. This is a little kind of cornucopia case that you'll see on fence posts and trees. Um, and I wouldn't say it was abundant, but you'll probably, you'll probably find it quite widespread. Um, the female, so this is one that in most of its um, uh, 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 part of this country has female only. And the female simply comes out of the case and lay, well, comes out of the case. Yes, it does. It actually emerges from the case and lays the eggs around the open end of that case and then just kind of falls off and dies. That's it. And then those eggs hatch and on goes to the next generation. If you do venture down to Cornwall uh, towards um, Penzance and you go to Marazion or on to, uh, 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 yes, Marazion or you're up to the Channel Islands, then you will find uh, mixed populations where there are males as well as females. So there they do have a sexual race. And in Europe, um, they're, they're, I don't know what the numbers are, but they've got sexual and asexual races throughout much of Europe. And effectively from the um, DNA, it's the same species. It's just that there are sexual races and asexual races within it. Another bizarre bit of plasticity in the insect world for you. Um, possible similar method of dispersal. Well, that's very interesting. Ah, who knows? But I, I mean, why not? Why not a tree creeper going up there and 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 uh, you know nipping the nipping the female? Because it surely is going to work, isn't it? So we need we need some birders who've got um, access to a bit of netting and be able to, uh, to to ringing or something and be able to hang on with a license to a tree creepers or something for a few days collect a poo and see if it happens but um no i wouldn't be doing properly of course but but it, yes it's almost certain i think that dispersal is happening by by birds and reptiles would be my guess and probably amphibia as well uh, you know for some psychids but certainly birds and reptiles would be my guess for most of them um right good 
any more any more any more questions does anybody have a question that they would like to just ask rather than type um if you'd like to just unmute yourself if you'd like to if not then um oh, then absolutely hold oh, to them. jenny jenny do you want to um, yeah, the, 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 um, the moth that you found on the, um, at Portland and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Swanage, um, what time of year were you, what, is there a best time of year to look for the, for the under rocks? Yes, there, there, ve there very definitely is. Um, we've almost missed it for this time of year. The, the best month to look for the cases is actually February, February and perhaps into early March. And I don't know why, but they just they just seem to be more visible. So you need gloves on because it's usually flipping cold and you just turn over the surface layer of rocks and you keep turning and you keep turning and then eventually you'll just find them. Have you, um, have you tried at Windspit? Yes. Oh, I, I was going to try there. Well, do. No, I mean, I've I've tried all the way along the coast wherever I can. Um, and so it's obviously hard chalk. So so that lower Cretaceous chalk and and the uh, and the portland limestone seem to be the right sorts of rock um but uh, i mean i've tried in various places but you know who knows it's been well worth trying more and more it's just that sometimes i mean maybe the population takes a dip and i've been there and it's it's not findable and maybe the year you go you'll find it, it okay. i mean my view is it must be somewhere between the two but i i've not found it but that doesn't mean to say that that uh, that it isn't there. Um, okay. There's a there's a limit to how much you can get to these places. But if you're off to Winsbit, do have a look. Thank you very much. Cheers. So Ben, are you happy to um, say what yes. you want to say? I am happy to. Yes. Thank you, Justin. Thanks, Phil, for a fantastic talk. Um, okay. So yeah, I'm I'm Ben Smart, and um, I just want to say a few words tonight on behalf of myself and Steve Palmer. Um, for those who don't know, I'm sure most of you do, Steve, as well as being an internationally respected entomologist, is a micromoth recorder for VC59 South Lancashire. Anyway, the two of us have been discussing a potential project for some time. And tonight we're really pleased to announce that with the um, financial and technical support of the Tnitra project, in particular Gary Hedges and Steve Judd, we're going to be producing a full colour hardback book giving a comprehensive account of the moths of Lancashire. Um, I've got a small PowerPoint presentation for which I must thank Carolyn Palmer for putting together. Um, so, oh, let's go to... Uh, we need to share screen first, don't we? Of course, that's how it works. Can you see that? Yeah, I can see a thumbs up there. So that looks promising. Okay, so okay, so the moths of Lancashire. So our intention here is that this will be a fully comprehensive assessment of the state of Lancashire's moths currently and in the past. Um, one that will be useful for entomologists studying Lancashire's moth fauna for years, decades, maybe even centuries, who knows. And our hope is that it will also serve to inspire a new generation of moth recorders to observe and take care of our precious moth fauna and their wider habitats. Um, initial thoughts are that this hardback book will need to be somewhere in the region of about 670 pages. with Good quality paper, just under A4 in size, full colour throughout, and will include detailed coverage with as many photos as possible of every single species recorded as ever touching down in VC 59 or VC 60, from around 1850 until the end of 2022. For each species, the plan is that there'll be an account of historical and modern records, including the first records, number of records. There'll also be a distribution map for each, similar to those recently published by the Tnitra project, but obviously updated versions. And where changes have occurred over time, There'll be documentation and analysis of trends and the frequency of the species and its distribution in the county. We're going to feature phenology graphs as well um, for the adult moths. We're going to look at the larvae too. We talked about doing larval phenology graphs. 
I think based on Lancashire findings, this is going to be difficult, but maybe possible for a few species. Um, and certainly where they exist, all larval records will be discussed with food plants used locally and the larval timing all documented. Um, we want to include a good level of detail for every species with photographs of Lancashire moths and the early stages where available, hence the high number of pages planned. We envisage perhaps having three species on a page, um, but with the occasional species such as belted beauties, maybe Cistus forester, even some special micros like Anania funebri, perhaps warranting a full page so we can cover them in a lot more detail. Um, and probably there'll be a small number of extra chapters looking at Lancashire habitats, special sites within the region, maybe a botanical review and look at the history of Lancashire moth recording. That has to be decided. Um, okay. So we've started now, the project's underway from spring 2021. We've both got a few projects on the go. Personally, I'm hoping to complete the second volume of Micromoth Field Tips in a month or two. And as Phil alluded to, I'll hopefully give um, Phil and Mark some help on the photography side with the update to the Micromoth Field Guide. And Steve's been obtaining historical records, including journals and individual recorders' notebooks from over the last couple of centuries, um, so that the findings can be digitalized and included in the book. We're hoping to get the book, well, we're going to get the book published probably sometime in spring 2024, certainly by the middle of 2024. Seems a long way off, but it's only three years. And to compile this much information, further research the history of Lancashire moth recording and write the book with over, you know, 1500 species accounts to source the photos, get a prof professional design in place and finally to actually publish a book of this size. It will take this long. And no doubt 2024 will be upon us before we know it. So our plan is that following the announcement today, we've got two seasons of field work in which we can add to our knowledge of the Lancashire moth fauna so that the book can be as comprehensive as possible. And obviously we can't do this without you. So what can you do to help? We'd really like everyone to get involved with this. And this, this is some of the things that we'd really like people to and join in with an assist. Um, firstly, record as many species as possible at your home trap site or wherever else you trap for that matter um, during 2021 and 2022 seasons. Um, secondly, visit an under-recorded tetrad in your area during different times of the year. Tetrad is a square that's two by two kilometers. Um, some are very well recorded, some are extremely poorly recorded, but no doubt all of them will have interesting species. Um, and some of the poorly recorded ones are obviously the ones where, you know, we'll find more and more new records. At some point, we'll hopefully be able to um, release some information pointing it towards under-recorded tetrads. And if everybody wants to think about, you know, sort of um, acquiring one or two new tetrads to have a look in and record as much as possible, that would be fantastic. Thirdly, the Tenitra Tetrad maps are out there now. They're wonderful. And if you haven't had a look, I recommend everybody to do so. And you can use those to target under-recorded species, especially those that haven't been seen in the last 20 years. Blue squares on the maps indicate they're not being seen since 1999. You might also want to have a look at the map and see if by any chance some of your records have been missed off the maps. If so, get those records off to, to Steve or, or the... Um, or the County Moth Recorder responsible um, for, for your area as soon as possible. Um, look out for our regular seasonal target notes first out soon. So we're going to be producing some notes of species to look for at certain times of year. And probably a good one would be the leaf mine to the right there, which shows um, Phylonerycta leucographella, the Firethorn leaf miner, which is a moth that sort of arrived out of nowhere in the last 20 years and has become really um, successful and quite common throughout the region, feeding on a range of plants, but mainly on pyracantha, firethorn. Um, it forms this little white upper surface mine. And no doubt there's many tetrads where it exists, where it hasn't yet been recorded. Um, and five, record wherever you are. Well, that's a perfect example. These plants will turn up in shopping centres and in country parks and 
anywhere really. Um, you keep an eye out for what you'll see. There's moths around, there's leaf mines around. Um, and if you haven't tried leaf mining before, if, if you know your, your mothing has mainly been looking at the adults, mainly the adults that turn up at the garden, um, moth trap then, well, you've got a treat in store because leaf mining is a whole new world and hopefully Phil's talk helped to generate some enthusiasm for that as well. Um, just say also, we're going to need photographs, lots of them. So this is going to be an opportunity for people to show off the moths that you've found and have them recorded for posterity. So all contributions gratefully received. We'd also like people to spread the word. Let family members, friends, work colleagues, members of other natural history groups know about our project and we'd welcome any records from them, even if they're not sure what it is. They or you are welcome to send me or Steve a photograph. Or if you put it on the Langshire Moths Facebook group, somebody will hopefully identify it for you. Um, it's important to say the record will still need to be submitted to the appropriate county moth recorder, either at the time of finding or whenever you submit your next batch of records. And that's because we need to ensure quality control and that everything recorded in this book is wholly reliable. If for any reason you're unable to submit, then just let me or Steve know and, and we may be able to submit it to the CMR, to the County Moth Recorder, on your behalf. Um, and just one word of caution, if you post your findings exclusively on Facebook or other social media but don't submit any records, then unfortunately those records will not be part of this project. But anyway, I hope you're excited by the prospects of this book. Me and Steve certainly are, and we intend that the book will be a permanent document of the efforts of all Langstrom Moth recorders, contemporary and historical. Any questions? Yes, I just put one in the chat, Ben. Um, and oh. I was just wondering where the seasonal target notes will be found. So you say that they'll be made available regularly. Where will these be put? Um, uh, Cutting on that, Ben. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Where's that voice? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let Steve answer that one. Yeah. Um, what What I'll be doing, Justine, is sending out firstly a set of notes to everybody who has, um, in the past, received information about moth recording in the county. So there'll be a basic introduction to all the facilities that will become available. Um, Gary edges that the Tenetra Trust is working on a under-recorded tetra map for us. Um, I'll be eventually coordinating with Ben a list of photographs we're particularly wanting, all that sort of thing. Um, we'll do it fairly regularly, but not probably two or three times a year, something like that. Um, more information on the first newsletter, and if that newsletter can be put on the BC website, all the better. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was going to um, You know, we'll do what we can to help you advertise it as much as possible. I'd just like to pass on to Steve and Ben, you know, congratulations for embarking on the project. I mean, absolutely amazing. Wonderful. And hard back and full kind of You know, uh, they, they are great. Look back, in, I don't know, in 2025 and go, nice project because they, it's fantastic to be able to hold in your hand. I mean, you think how the, how much from the oh, yeah. atlas of the, of the moths of Great Britain and Ireland that Butterfly Conservation did nearly died over. You know, the number of staff who've kind of fallen by the wayside in trying to get that finished. But, but you know, there are two of you working on this with all the effort from the Lanks and the Cheshire group, brilliant. And, and I think it will be, yes, it will be very useful in a century's time. Amazing, well done, and, and good luck. And if I can help you along the way, just ask, of course. Thank you very much, Phil. Certainly, if, if you're heading up this way and you want to pay us a visit, then we'd love to see you. Well, yeah, well, yes, I mean, and indeed, over the last, I don't know how many times we thought of me calling in to see. <laughs> it's been rather thwarted in the last uh, year plus, but um, but yeah, the intention is to come there and uh, and yeah. Have some fun because you've got some great species there too. Wonderful different habitats. Um, lots to write about. That's a really good oh, yes. I mean, bless you, this is not Bedfordshire. <laughs> you've got some superb places to, 
that right. I mean, I don't want to underrate Bedfordshire because you know, it has lots of amazing things in it, but somehow we farmed the Bedfordshire to death, and there's not much left. But uh, but but Lancashire and, uh, has really still got a lot going for it, and um, and and it's full of interest, full of intrigue. I think that's the the most exciting part of it. You can sort of start down on the coast, and you've got the salt marsh, sandy sandy dunes, some really fantastic dune systems, and then you, immediately you're going up into limestone in the north, mossland in the south, uh, and then up into the moors, and everything in between the the wooded valleys of the northeast of the county. The it's just it's got pretty well a little bit of everything. Uh, and more can be so mild that we get things which really shouldn't be this far north. So com everything combined makes it an exciting county. Uh, I suppose that, yeah, you know, are you going to be discussing or including photographs of the habitats that you think of the, the key habitats that 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 kind of spell Lancashire in the in that uh, in in the volume? Do you think you'll do that, or will you see how it goes? It, it, it was sort of discussed and um, there's a very, very good book by the Lancashire Wildlife Trust, um, which was put out covering all the various habitats. So we felt in a way that because of the number of species we've got, we've got 15, 1,524 species to cover. Uh, so even with three, uh, even with three species a page, it, it's going to be pushed. No, look, if it's already been done, if it's already been done, but but I but I think the only bit of advice I would say is just remember that because we're moffers, we look at the world in a different way to plant ecologists and plant identifiers, and that yeah. to us defines a moth habitat isn't the same as defines I don't know a plant habitat. You know, of course, dunes and woodlands and all the rest of it. But some, yeah. so so reserve a reserve a page for things that 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 habitats don't quite describe where you've got a lot of moths in them. Yes, yeah. and that might be urban. It might be urban habitats which are full of mm -hmm. them, and, and that can never get classified anywhere. Yeah, we, we've actually got um, one wow. classic garden in the in the county where somebody's been recording for about thirty years. And um, we feel that that is is very much deserving of its own individual coverage. Um, uh, it's just it's really good. Yeah, no, that, that that that's my point. Particularly urban habitats, and it's not it's not brownfield. I mean, brownfield a bit of a dull term, but it's just urban gardens. That's where most people are recording, and and uh, I think it's well worth kind of celebrating the fact that moth recorders in particular love their gardens. <laughs> Yes. And, and and you know so don't underestimate the value of that in 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 planning through and of course they will be the majority of the records i guess will be from gardens rather yeah. than out in the countryside yeah yeah so, and congratulations in you know go to it <laughs> <laughs> one thing i'd say about uh, habitats is uh, when i'm having a, a lot of problem where i live in is near accrington between accrington and blackburn and the the amount of understory is minimal you know, it's getting trashed by dog walkers and so on. I'm trying to get um, the local council just to identify that as a habitat yep. because they think, oh, well, it's, it's just nothing there. We'll build more houses on it. Ah, it's, well, yeah. It's, yeah. It's yeah. Worse watch, worse. yeah, watch this space. That's a whole nother talk that I could give. Um, <laughs> and that's in relation to urban habitats and how we do look to conserve and enhance those. You transport just what you've said down into London and those habitats are now protected habitats despite no understory and planted you know planted trees those are the valuable green spaces absolutely I mean I've got a local park which used to be excellent yeah. for birds and now it's just overrun with dogs and gray squirrels and they all feed the squirrels and there's it's just trashing everything um, just and there's no know. birds no, <laughs> and we have to do something about that mm. And, um, and, you know, it's not lost. It is lost for you. And it's a real shame. And I've seen so many habitats, you know, trashed. But, but I've also seen habitats that are put back together again, mm -hmm. that are really flourishing, and, and are then valued by the community for the very interests that are there. And, and so, so it, is, it's, you know, it is repairable, but there's a bit of effort required. Yeah. 
Anyway, sorry, that was a bit off piece, wasn't it? But there we go. <laughs> Any other questions? No, well, with that, all I can say is uh, thank you very much uh, to Phil and to Ben. Um, fantastic talks. Um, and it's great to hear um, about such an, an exciting project in Lancashire. I think I'm quite lucky, as you've already said, um, with what we've got in Lancashire in terms of species richness and habitat diversity. Uh, and for that to be documented quite thoroughly is, uh, is no mean feat. And uh, I don't envy you whatsoever. Good luck. Thank you, Justine. <laughs>